Well, welcome to the Ignited Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Pears. I'm going to continue to talk about The Secret Place, but in this episode, I want to take you into deeper waters. I want to share a message. Now, I've talked on this subject before, but we're going to revisit it and we're going to go deeper because I believe that the Lord wants us to come into that place where we have such an intimate relationship with Him, that we know Him, and that we come beyond, in that deep water, beyond our own ability, where we have to wholly trust in Him, where we become so confident in our relationship, so built strong on His Word, that we're unshaken. We look in this hour and everything that's happening, and that you and I were called, anointed, and appointed for such a time as this. As we see everything being shaken, we should have an unshakable kingdom in us. And that comes by being found securely in the secret place in Him. This is the hour where I believe the church needs to step up. The world is looking for something real, and it needs to see that in you and I. So I pray this message, and I'm going to share insight from Smith Wigglesworth. I pray this message truly challenges you, encourages you, provokes you, edifies you, and calls you and helps you to get into a deeper, more intimate relationship with the Lord, that we might know Him and be known by Him. And by that, I mean that every area of our life is laid on the altar, made available to Him, and that we are being changed. Father, I just thank you for this word. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Minister life to each person. Show them how today to get into a deeper relationship with you. How to go deeper, Father. Father, I hear the call of your Spirit to come, that you want rich fellowship with us. So today, we come and we surrender, we yield. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart, that we may be in tune with you. We don't want to walk just simply in the knowledge of your word, but we want your word, which is alive and true, to work in us, to glorify Jesus through us. I give you all the honor, I give you all the praise, and thank you in the name of Jesus. I love the story of George Mueller and that orphanage that he built to be a living testimony that God is faithful. The burden of thousands of children on his back, yet standing on precious promises. He wanted this orphanage to be a statement that God is the Lord our provider. Not asking publicly for money, but trusting in the Lord. I believe that the world is looking for something real. And we as believers are meant to be living epistles read by all. Now, we're not perfect. And I'm glad that He is a God rich in mercy and that He's always at work. And if we will learn to surrender, He will turn around all things and make it work for our good. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, it says, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sanctified. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, uh, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's never been an hour where we need to be people that are sincere and true. The world is looking for integrity, and yet it completely lacks it. It's looking for transparency, and it should see that in the church. We are meant to be salt and light. We are meant to be people that are truly sincere, filled with integrity, walking in truth. If we will learn to walk in such an awe and fear of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, then we will see our lives being changed and we will lay off that old leaven. Stop walking by that old way. In 2 Corinthians 7 verses 1 and 2a, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilements of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, making room for us in your hearts. And I believe that in this hour, we look at, of course, in Peter's second letter, that by these precious promises, um, we are to be so changed that it separates us out of this world 
and all the defilements of, of course, the lusts of our flesh. In this hour, we see that we are, of course, living in the last days, and Jesus is coming soon. It is a perilous, difficult time. It's an hour where we cannot just simply look and say we have all these precious promises, but we've got to possess them, and our lives have got to lay a hold of them and walk them out. I want to share the story of Jacob. Now, I've talked about this story before, but we're really going to press into deeper water. So stay with me because I know if the Spirit of God, uh, if you'll give Him access and allow Him to speak to you, this message will truly have such an impact on your life. Wigglesworth said this, Years before, Jacob and his mother had formed a plan to secure the blessing that Isaac was going to give Esau. How inglorious was the fulfilling of this carnal plan. It resulted in Esau's hating Jacob and saying in his heart, When my father is dead, then I will slay my brother and Jacob. And that is based on Genesis 27, verse 41. I am sharing a lot from my own life because I look at my own life where God turned up once and said, You are like unto me a David. I like that. A man after God's own heart. But he said, You are also like unto me a Jacob. And not fully understanding, I still knew that what he was saying was not good. There were areas in my life that had to be changed. As I look back now, by the Holy Spirit, I see how much of my life I laid hold of something from God, but in all my efforts, through my scheming and planning, I sought to bring and produce that which God was calling me to. So I was sincere in the sense that I desired to do something big for God, but it was all me. And I didn't realize nor understand all the damage and death I was causing. And many of us are walking in something where out of sincerity, we have been trying to do something big for God, but it has been 100% of us. We have hurt people. We have done so much damage, and we're ignorant of that. And we need to come to a place where our hearts are made so soft again, where we're not focused on us, but our eyes are on Jesus and being a blessing. We would learn to step into the blessing that God has for us by simply desiring to be a blessing instead of always being focused on us. Smith Wigglesworth added, our own plans frequently lead us into disaster. Now, I think of this message and many of you are like, I don't want to hear this, but we do need to hear this. Because if we're going to step into something that God has that's always bigger, that is so good and so rich, most of us have never tasted that. We've wanted and we've been so sincere doing something good and big for God, but it has been so much of us. And we've never experienced the peace, the joy and all the things that God desired for us, and we blamed everybody else but ourselves. I've discovered in the sacred place, as you come in, that God begins to do a cleaning of house. All the old leaven is exposed and has to be removed. In Jewish tradition, the Father comes before Passover and He searches the house. And Father God wants to come and have such access in us as we dare go into the sacred place and allow Him to come and cleanse all that old leaven, all those things that have caused so much hurt, so much damage. I look back and what I did in trying to do something which I said was big, and as the Lord said, you were sincere, but sincerely wrong. The damage that caused, that impacted so many people. And so instead of being a blessing, I was in many ways a curse. Smith said this, Jacob had to flee from the land, but how good the Lord was to the fugitive. He gave him a vision of the ladder and the angels ascending and descending, which is Genesis 28, 12. How gracious is our God. Personally, I look back and how that even in my own stupidity, God was still good to me because despite of all, I was seeking him. I was desiring him. And I pray that this message show minister to you, but God is rich in mercy. He's so tender. He's so good. And that He's always calling us. I had to flee the purpose, the plan that God had. The land that He'd given. See, Jacob had been given an inheritance and he didn't understand it. God had given a word that it belonged to him. And he could not trust that God would bring about, but rather through his own workings was trying to make it happen and ended up having to flee. 
how often we have stepped in and God said, this is my purpose, plan, your inheritance. But through our own stupidity, we end up having to run from it. But in the midst of it all, God still being rich in mercy has been touching. So how can we step into deep water? So stay with me because I pray, as I said, I'm going to show you how to step into the deep waters and let God restore and redeem. How God can take around, turn around everything that we have done and do something so big and so glorious. And that in the midst of it, God begins such a work in us that he takes that which the enemy meant for evil and turns around so wonderfully for our good. And it changes our heart, changes us. Jacob, of course, came to this place where all of a sudden God began to speak and said, it's time because God has appointed times for you. And we need to make sure that we're in the right season doing what God wants. And so the Lord meets with him and says, Jacob, it's time to return to Canaan. I'm giving it into your hands. It's time to go back. But Jacob had fled. And maybe you've seen the areas where you have been defeated and we've run from because we've been so badly hurt and defeated. And God is saying, I'm taking you back, but this time I'm going to bring you in with victory. I'm going to turn that place where you were defeated and make it a place of victory. This is deeper waters in the secret place where I allow God to so change me, to transform, to have access so that the very things that brought me to defeat, God can now work on, minister in me so that now coming back and the enemy tries to play the same games to so defeat me once again, those areas now crucified with Christ so that where I am weak, I'm now strong in him. I come back in the power of his might. Smith Wigglesworth said this, he refused to have his plans of grace frustrated by the carnal workings of Jacob's mind. And that night he revealed himself to Jacob saying, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I've done that which I've spoken to you. Which of course is based on Genesis 28 to 12. Here Jacob is fleeing, but the Lord meets with him. And the Lord is explaining to him, listen, I'm not leaving you. And I shall do that for which I've said. And I want you to hear that God is saying to you, I shall bring forth that which I promised because he's faithful, even when we're not. And that if we will trust. Now, I look at all those years where he kept speaking to me and talking to me and I missed it because I allowed my hurts, my emotions, my feelings to speak so loud and to so control my life that I was running not from, sorry, running from him instead of to him. Held captive by my past and my pain instead of being made free in the secret place of his presence. And God so desires, he was trying so desperately to reach Jacob, but kept saying, Jacob, I'm always here. And I want you to know that God is saying to you, look, I'm always here. Will you come into the secret place and seek my face? Because if you will, I can change everything. If you will, I can touch and I can restore you and I can lift you. But it took a season. In Psalm 105 verse 19, it says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And this was speaking about Joseph, but it's true about us all. That word, that promise, that thing that God spoke because it was a living thing. That word tested him because that word was trying to produce in him the character and the heart and to bring him to the place where he could step in to that inheritance. The call to come into the secret place, there is a change that must occur in us. There's something that must change in us and the old leaven, the old us must be crucified. The old of us, our own ways, us trying to do it by us our strong opinions, our hurts, our brokenness, all must be put on the altar. We have to come as we're to discover, and I'm trying to help you, lead you through this one, to that place where God is now finally, once and for all, able to take those and deliver us from them. In Genesis 31, verse 41, Jacob said this, 
If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been for me, surely now you have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the toils of my hand, so he rendered judgment last night. And I look, so, so much of Jacob's life, he is running in fear of his brother, not walking into the inheritance. God had called him to possess an inheritance, but he's not able to because he's walking in fear, fleeing. And in the midst of it, he has been that which he ran from, the very person that he was, he finds in his uncle, in Laban. And this man who is a manipulative schemer uh, that is trying to steal from Jacob, the very person that Jacob was. And so we often, that which we're running from, we run into. But I want you to hear that today. God's saying, would you come into the secret place? Because I have an appointment with you. Oh, I heard those words so often. The Lord saying, I have an appointment. And I looked and I so expected that one day he would just suddenly appear. Or I might have this divine visitation where he would take me to heaven. And it never happened. I said, Lord, I don't understand. You keep saying that. Where is my divine visitation? It took a long time because there was so much brain tissue knowledge hindering because the things of God are spirit and they must be received in the spirit. And we need the Holy Spirit to so bring us interpretation and make it known to us. And as long as we are strong in ourselves, we will miss it. As long as you're strong in your thinking and your opinions, you will miss it. But there's something where I come into the secret place and that place of humility and surrender, which often is the place of brokenness. Jacob, hearing this call, now starts to return to the land. And maybe you're feeling the stirring in your spirit and something's happening and you know you need to step back in. You know that you need to move forward with the things of the Lord. But you've messed up. You've done so many things. And there's things you're running from. Here Jacob was. Now it's no longer just him. See, it's easy when it was just me. But now there is a burden on my shoulders. There's weights I'm carrying. That God, if you don't move, and I go under, there's so much at stake. There's lives at stake. So many people can be hurt. And that's touching me. And so Jacob knew he had to make and lay hold of the Lord because there was so much. He said this, Smith Wigglesworth, if he ever needed the Lord, it was just at this time. He wanted to be alone with God. And there comes a moment, I believe in all of our lives, where we recognize I need to be alone with you, Lord. I absolutely need you. We become so desperate. And what we don't understand That is that visitation, that God's stirring something in our spirit in the midst and in His great mercy calling us. Would you come into the secret place of my presence? Would you come? I'm waiting for you. I've always been waiting. Now that you sit in a place where all of a sudden you realize your need, because as long as we're strong in ourselves, as long as we know that we can make things happen, We don't have that brokenness or pursuit. But see, the secret place, there is no boasting in you. And as long as you can boast in yourself and your own skills and your own ability, that very thing will keep you out of the secret place. I look at all of my life. I would have these great services or go to great meetings and I would have just so touched by heaven and I could see what I know now is the secret place. I could see the presence, but I felt this veil and I said, God, I know the veil has been torn. Why is there a veil separating you and me? And I kept crying and one day he says, it's not me, it's you. You have put a veil up through your opinions, through yourself, and being strong in you, boasting in your own flesh, and not coming. I was talking about this, the finished work of the cross. What do I mean by that? When Jesus said, it is finished, the price fully paid, access given, and now I come, not boasting in anything in me, 
but simply by faith, trusting in what He did, recognizing my absolute need of what He did on the cross, my absolute need of Him, and that I need to have a visitation with you in the secret place. Like Jacob, because let me share something else. The Lord saw Jacob's need and came down to meet him. It was he who wrestled with the supplanter, breaking him, changing him, and transforming him. When we suddenly realize that God's saying, listen, I recognize and know your need, and I care so much. I am able to so give you the breakthrough. I am able to so deliver you. I am able to take the situation and turn it around. But you have to come and trust me. You cannot do it your way. The way into the secret place, into the deep waters of his presence, is a place built upon obedience. We look at Jesus, the role model, and he had to come to a place, not my will, but your will be done. A place of complete, absolute surrender. A place of yielding and laying down his life, not just on the cross, but every single day that he lived on this earth. In obedience, choosing the Father's will over his own. And if we're going to come into the deep waters of his presence and truly know him, then we too must come in that place of obedience to him, allowing the Holy Spirit to expose all areas of our life that are not in compliance. All areas in our life that are violating, hindering. I don't want to be kept out because I suddenly realize that, God, I need you. I need your presence. And so I'm going to say the first thing, if you want to go in the deep water, is recognize you absolutely need him. You cannot make it by yourself. Now, we say this, but there's a knowing. There's a place where we really know it. And we stop running to people. And we really go after the Lord when no one's looking. God, I absolutely have to have you. And I recognize that, God, you have the answer that you've always been there rich in mercy. Jacob knew that his brother Esau had the power to take away all he had and to execute vengeance upon him. He knew that no one could deliver him but God. And there alone, lean in soul, impoverished in spirit, he met with God. In that place where suddenly we realize and we just stop saying it's not fair and we start to realize, God, it's no longer about me. I need you. My demands for so long, it's not fair. And all the things which are more about me, instead of that place of surrender saying, God, it wasn't fair what happened to Jesus. It wasn't right. But I understand now as you're opening my eyes to see ears to hear of your great tenderness and mercy and that if I will trust you in this, if I will press in and dare surrender and lay down and trust that your ways are perfect and stop trying to do it because now I look and see all this time I've had that ability to somehow make a way and overcome. There was a safety net, but everything now is gone. And the enemy, I look, and he has the power to exact vengeance on me and to destroy me totally. How do I overcome? It doesn't look good, Lord. Oh, how we need to get alone with God, to be broken, to be changed, to be transformed. And when we do meet him, he interposes. All care and strife are brought to an end. Get alone with God and receive the revelation of His infinite grace and His wonderful purposes and plans for your life. So long I was seeking purpose, plan, seeking value. I never understood that it came in me losing me, losing sight of myself. In that place of surrender, saying, God, I come. I've been taught so much that as a believer, we're supposed to be on the mountaintops. Hated the word broken because we're not called to be broken. Fought against it, resisted it. Until one day I found the Lord 
was desiring to bring me to this place of brokenness, that it was me standing in the way. And until this vessel, this stubbornness of myself, like Jacob, until it was finally dealt with, until I'd wrestled with him, until every part of me was brought and made weak, until fatigue of my own ability came, and I recognized that, God, I have to cling to you. I have to trust to you. And all of a sudden, something happened that that guard I'd put around my heart because of so much hurt and not being able to trust anybody, I didn't even trust the Lord. But here, as I sought Him, there is a place where there was a brokenness that came and that hard heart that had been so wounded and injured, cracked, bled. And all of a sudden, the rain of the Spirit fell on it and it became soft again. I started to see the me that I desired for so long to be. The me that was so hidden, so covered, all my efforts and desperate attempts to bring it forth failed because flesh cannot produce things of the Spirit. Flesh always produces death. Hebrews 9, 8, the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place, the secret place, has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, while the old me remains, while the old me remains Lord, while the old me continues to dictate and have control. The access to the deep waters of His presence is hindered. But in this place, as I pressed in and said, God, I need you, the Holy Spirit began such a work in me, and there was a wrestling. You can't do this in five minutes. You cannot do this in a 10-minute prayer. See, everything up to then had been so formulated. Because it was by faith, we prayed quickly. We stood on a promise, and therefore it was so. But there was no possessing of the promise. There was no allowing the promise to do something in me. There was no clinging and fixing my eyes on Jesus. There was no hungering and thirsting after Him. Smith said this, when we get alone with God, what a place of revelation. What a revelation of self we receive. And then we receive a revelation of the provision made for us on Calvary. It is here that we get a revelation of a life crucified with Christ, buried with Him, raised with Him, transformed by Him, and empowered by Him. I'm so grateful that He comes and He begins to reveal you, just as He had to begin to show Jacob, Jacob, the person that Jacob was running from, that God kept trying to reveal to him through Laban, and through his circumstances, yet he never saw. I look at my own life and how that which I was running from, I kept running into. And what I was really running into was me. And I missed the message from heaven. But in this place of desperation, seeking his face, saying, God, I just need to know you. And in the brokenness where there's a baptism of tears and crying out with sincerity, no one looking not depending on anybody to fix it, make it right, but God, you, that you are the rewarder of those that diligently seek you. I am diligently seeking you alone. God, I've taken this time, this place to really meet you. No preconceived plan or formula, but I come and simply surrender. I come and say, you are Lord, have your way. And it started, as I entered in, I started by the Holy Spirit to get such a revelation of the price He paid for me and that me, of the me, the real me, and my own stupidity, my own wretchedness. That was hard initially because I had to see myself as I really was. And see, most of us are held captive by that because we've never faced it. Most of us walk in a poor self-image. Most of us walk hindered because we've never entered the deep water of His presence and allowed Him, first of all, to show you the real you. 
then to show you the cross and the price paid that he saw something different. See, there was a person I saw, but you know, he looked and he saw something different, something of such worth. This lump of coal, he saw a diamond. And then, as I continue to cling by faith and say, God, I just receive, I suddenly saw the new person, the person that went through the cross, the person that as I chose to die with him, that he took and buried me with him. And there was a place where there's a grave that has my name on it. The old me died. All my scheming and my ways died. And I remind myself, oh, so often when that old person tries to come back, you died. I remember the pain of it. You died. And then I remember being raised up with him by the Spirit, now living in a new life, not by my flesh, trying to make it happen, but in a place of surrender. In a place where I need this relationship with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit. That I started to see the Word from a different perspective. That He raised me and seated me in heavenly places. And that my new place is to be identified, not as the old, but with Him. Identified with who I am in Him. So connected, I am bought with a price, I'm no longer my own. That I come and surrender and yield. And say, God, I choose life. I choose your way. And then I surrender and allow him to live it through me. That wretched person of trying to always overcome sin and failing. Trying to overcome the flesh by the flesh. Killed. Died in the sick of place. And in this place of saying, God, I choose your way. And now, Holy Spirit, live it out through me. Teach me, show me. Simple surrendered life. I started to find that my heart, my mind were His. The throne of my affection, the throne of my imagination consumed by Him. I started to desire to spend less time focused on all these things that had so captivated me. That now, those sins, those things that held me fading, not trying to perfect and walk holy in of myself like I was, but now I'm finding that I'm doing it by His hand, carried by His Spirit. We are occupied too much with the things of time in this world. We need to spend time alone in the presence of God. We need to give Him much time in order to receive new revelation from Him. Time invested in saying, God, I'm here. I take my word, the Bible, sit here, praying, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see, ears to hear. Praying, praying in the Spirit and just longing and crying out and saying, God, I want to hear from you. I want a word from you. I'm not going to just read this thing intellectually. I want to just read this and get inspiration. I want life. And so I'm praying, seeking your face. And then I just say, lead me, show me. And I begin to open. And now all of a sudden I find that something stirred in me. And the word has a life and an authority and a richness and a deep. It does something goes so much beyond anything I can imagine. I'm pulling from the vine. I'm saying, God, that life... As I surrender and yield and allow the Holy Spirit to pray through me, He brings forth that word. He brings forth the rivers. We were called to come and drink of the well, and most of us stopped there. But in the secret place of His presence, by this daily making a decision to spend time and invest and to pray and to pray forth, to call forth the things of God in your life, to speak over the gift, to speak over your spirit life, to speak over the word and say, bring, come forth. All of a sudden, rivers of living water pouring out. No longer focused on those things which are temporal. The hurts, the memories, all those things that are temporal. 
and now starting to see something from this wonderful relationship that I'll spend eternity knowing him. And that God wants to do something so big, so much bigger, greater than anything I can imagine in me on this earth now that would do great things for his kingdom. Ephesians 3, 16 through 17. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and you being grounded and rooted in love, that the Spirit would strengthen you in the inner man, in the secret place where I'm God, I want to be strong in you, strong in knowing you, strong in a relationship with you. See, you want a strong relationship with somebody. You pursue them. You have fellowship and communication with them. Real communication. It has to get real. And the Father calling out and inviting us in to always come deeper. But see, we're always wanting to stay in the shallow water where we can still remain in control. And some of us get to the place of the breakers. But the breakers resist us and they make it difficult. But those that are willing to go into the deep waters... That place where it's scary, where you lose control. Because I want to know you. I want to know you, Father. This has got to be real between you and me. This has got to get intimate. I don't want to just talk about it. I look at the hears of faith and they discovered, though I know it's available, I see it in the Word. I know that this rich relationship is available. Holy Spirit, strengthen me in the inward man. I've learned so much. The Holy Spirit is so wonderful. And He is available on the earth. He should be your best friend. He's your teacher. He's your strengthener. He's your comfort. Oh, we need to get to know and receive and honor the wondrous Holy Spirit. To take time in the secret place and say, Holy Spirit, I'm here. Teach me about Jesus. Show me. Strengthen me in the inner man so that Christ will dwell in my heart by faith. I want to be grounded and rooted in love. I want my life secure so that everything that I do in my life comes out of a security, out of a grounding and rooting in love. So much of my life, like Jacob, wrong motivations running in fear out of a selfishness, out of a leaven that needed to be removed. Hurt, disappointment, discouragement, all the things that Jacob knew that came out of that wrong lifestyle, that in she enter in the secret place, God wants to so take from us. As we surrender and say, here. As he opens her eyes and begins to reveal to you these things and said, let me remove it that it's by grace through faith. But that price of paying, of choosing God and being willing to face ourselves and allow Him access to every area to take on that price of the ridicule and the persecution saying, God, I need you. I want you. Matthew 13, 18 through 23. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one in whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one in whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no firm root in him. But it is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately falls away. And the one in whom the seed was sown among the thorns. This is the one, the man who hears the word and the deceitfulness of wealth. Choke the word and make it unfruitful. And the one in whom the seed was sown on good soil. This is the man who hears the word and understands it. Who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Holy Spirit, open this. We come 
in the name of Jesus. We're seeking your face, Father. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Teach us. Show us us, the real us. Show us our soil type. Do the litmus test and let us see it. See where we fail. And show us how now to be changed by your spirit. We've come to wrestle with you that today everything would change. Everything in us would be exposed and transformed because God wants to bring you to such a rich soil. It's time to stop living along that path, so close to the path, I should say, that we're so close to life and the cares, the things of life, so dominate so control us. And God says, I want you out of that. And some of us have walked in a place where there's all the stones and the rocks. We need the Holy Spirit to come and remove those. And it has to make a decision. We have to make it say, yes, I surrender. Here, take it. Casting all those things, letting go, have such an operation in my heart. Come and plow it open. Come, make it soft again by the reign of your spirit. I want the word. I want it to be implanted. I want to mix faith with it. I don't care if it offends me, God. I want it. I need your word because your word is life. Your word is truth. Your word is spirit. We need the Holy Spirit like the disciples in John 6 where Jesus spoke such an offensive word and that even they grumbled. But they recognized he spoke the words of life and spirit and they realized that they needed it, even though it was offending them, even though it was exposing them. We need you, Jesus. That's a price we have to pay that, God, I know I need you. Change me because I believe that God wants to bring us to a place of vibrancy, Jesus said that he came that we might have life and that abundant and how many of us are walking in that, yet that is your promise today and now. I love to go walk in my garden and I have three acres that I'm converting back. I got part of them making a wood and planting all these trees and part converting back to like a prairie and have all these wild flowers growing. And it's been changing over time. And I love to go back because I'm big into photography, just to go back there and spend time and watch these wildflowers covered in all kinds of insects. And I took my, bro, my son the other day, my son back, and he said it's, it's, it's like its own ecosystem because it's so alive. There's so much noise. I sat there and I saw all kinds of birds. There was a woodpecker, there was a hummingbird. I mean, there's all these kinds of birds, all these different kinds of butterflies and insects. It's overwhelming and there's all the colors of the flower. There's so much vibrancy and depth to it. And the word is supposed to be vibrant and deep and alive in you. If we will allow the Holy Spirit to so plant it in us and allow it to grow and allow it to be, take us and bring us and restore us back to what we're supposed to be a new creation in him so we don't walk according to an old order our way of doing it but rather in this place of surrender walk now by the spirit jacob on the way in he's going back and he's returning he has an encounter with these angels but they still weren't enough we often think if i just had an angel appear and we live from an encounter to an encounter. We think somehow we just had another encounter. And God says, I want a visitation. I want a real encounter heart to heart with me where you are changed. Not just a life built upon feelings, but a life built upon a heart change, a heart connecting with his, the deep in us, connecting with the deep in him. And that starts with a quality decision, a quality pursuit. Smith said the testing hour came when at the break of day, the angel who was none other than the Lord, our master, that testing time came at that hour where all of a sudden daylight had come. The day when he was going to meet Esau. 
but he knew that he couldn't meet him until he received the blessing. See, don't stop just because you've had this change and I'm so grateful for God was doing such a work in me, but there's more that God, I need you to change me, but I need the blessing. And I believe that God's saying, would you come expectant, come ready to receive because God wants to put something into you. He's been emptying you, changing you. And most of us leave empty. And God says, I don't want you to leave empty. I want you to live filled, flowing, overfull. Smith said this, as I bring this one to an end. You must never let go. Whatever you're seeking, a fresh revelation, light on the path some particular thing never let go victory is yours if you are earnest enough if you are in darkness if you need fresh revelation if you need a fresh revelation if your mind needs relief if you're a problem you cannot solve lay a hold of god and declare i will not let you go until you bless me Like Jacob, I will not let you go because until your words are spoken, because I recognize now in this place, empty of myself, empty of the wrong thinking, in this place, I suddenly realize that your words are so filled with life and an authority and that your words, once spoken, you watch over your word to perform it. Because up to now, I have been trying to perform things. I have been taking things out of the word promises because there was something stirring in me, a call and taking promises and trying to make them happen. But now in the secret place under this new order, the order of the spirit, here I recognize your words, say the word, just say the word I want to hear. I need that word spoken into my life. We need to stay long enough in his presence. You need this daily speak. I need to hear your word spoken. I need to see you talk to me. Look me in the eyes and I need to hear what you have to say because I know with every word there's a life. There's a creative force to it. And I know that that word that you speak, you watch over to perform it. The Holy Spirit hovers over it. And I want that word implanted in me. I want that word in me. I want that word changing me. I want that word working. I'm tired of me and my thoughts and my plans. I want what you have. I know I can't face tomorrow. I cannot overcome based on me. What I face today is too big, too great. But your word, your word was tested. Your word was proven. Your word is overcome. Your word has created all things. I know that Jesus, you are the living word. As I receive that, as I'm strengthened by the Holy Spirit, the inner man now receiving Jesus, that word planted in me, that word enthroned in me, that word now able to do that for which it sent. You step into a new day. You were able to face. And like Jacob, there was such a change in that man. His name had to be changed. (laughs) He could no longer be Jacob, the supplanter. But now he was Israel, the victorious one. And God is saying over you this day, I called you by a name. And as I call you by name, I speak purpose. I speak value. I speak victory. I want to speak over you, your name, your name. And as I do it to speak over you such greatness to speak over you that you are more than a conqueror that now in my hands that everything the enemy meant for evil I'm going to turn around for good that I am the God who's able to restore and redeem today for you I need you I hear the word the Lord speaking to you I want you I desire you I'm speaking to you I am calling you by name if you receive my word My word will do that for which I've sent it. My word has all authority. My word is a living word, is forever settled. 
And today, if you'll receive it by faith, my word will be forever settled in your life and in your circumstances. And by my word, these promises, you will become a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the lusts that are in the world. You become an overcomer. Every day, now you cling in the secret place. Every day, this old removed so that the access that had been, all those things that have been hindering you from access gone, now you can come in and you can make this your dwelling place. And every day you get up and say, God, I'm here for fresh manna. I'm here for the bread of your presence. I'm here to go into the deeper waters. I want to go deeper with you. I want to go always deeper, more of you, less of me. Today, now you understand why I say, every day you get, get up and you get out of bed, you begin it as a way you mean to continue. You no longer go by what the day presents, but you go by your ex what you know of Him in the secret place. And you dare say that this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will be glad in it because of, through, and for Him. I am more than a conqueror in Him. I am the head and not the tail. I come above only, not beneath. Everything I put my hands to prospers. Why? Not because of anything of me. There's no boasting in me. There's a boasting in Him. There's a boasting in the one who's changed me. There's a boasting how the Holy Spirit's working in me. There's a boasting in the one who's grounded me and rooted me in love. And how there's an overflow of this love in this new nature. How that I have become a new creation, something so radically different, changed. How I was once blind, but now I see. How I could not hear, but now I do by the Spirit of the living God. How His Word is life to me. How I've come to the well, but I've discovered that now I've got a river flowing from me. That I came and I got blessed, but now I am a blessing in Him. Amen. Oh, I pray that you've got this. And I pray as we put more out on the deeper water, you will listen to them. And they will help you. That you will go strong in the Lord. In this relationship. Going deeper. That God, I just want to know you and be known by you. I want to know your heart and everything about you. So when I look at your promises, I understand them. And they carry such an authority. I know, the, oh, your motivation. Your thoughts behind them. And I receive them. And I am now a son or a daughter. And the Holy Spirit in the secret place now bearing witness of who I am. Too much of my life, everything bore witness of who I wasn't. How I wasn't a son. How I wasn't that person. But now, I abide in the secret place of His presence and the Holy Spirit bearing witness. Because He's the one that's changing me. He is the one that's transforming me. He is the one that's bringing forth in every area of my life the Lordship of Jesus. Amen. Oh, I pray this message blessed you. I pray that you've got it. I pray, Father God, for each person. And I speak life over them. And I speak a breakthrough. Holy Spirit, I thank you. Draw them into the secret place of your presence, Father. And may they have such a rich and deep encounter with you, both sin and Ebe, that they're never the same. They're changed not by their own doing, but by your Holy Spirit transformed. And Father wrote, Sikkim, that this word would so be rich. This word, Father God, deep in revelation, not something where we add, but Holy Spirit sharing that which was spoken, line upon line, precept upon precept, building this thing. Father God, that it gets deep in us, that we become grounded, rooted in your love. Not in a meanness or a harshness, Father God, but for so changed, radically changed, that we are now hearers and doers of this word. Not doing it religiously or legalistically, but Father, doing it by the Spirit, filled, as Paul said, preaching the gospel, not with the wisdom of man, not through some inspirational thing, not trying to put on a show, not trying to take the various fruit of the Spirit and somehow make them manifest in my life. But Father, in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, where He's bringing it forth, where people see Him and not me, where I so surrender, I so yield, I so let go, and I say, Father, have your way in me.
day after day after day. It doesn't happen overnight, but every day as I come, every day as I surrender, this thing is happening. I'm being changed. Just like that land that I'm transforming. Oh, how I wished overnight it would just have changed. Those trees have grown. But every year I go back and I take a picture and I look at the previous year and I compare how much it's changed. And God wants to bring you in and say, let me show you how much you've changed. Not by your doing, but in your surrender and allowing me to do what only he can do. His spirit working. Now as he takes in these words, you listen to them and you take more time every day. It can't be five minutes. You can't do this in a five minutes. But every opportunity, God, I'm in this word looking at it. I'm so in love with you, in love with your word. And I want you, Holy Spirit, speaking to me through this word, giving depth to it. It's my life. It's my breath. Amen. Oh, I pray you're blessed. I pray that you're so encouraged and you're getting this in the name of Jesus. I would ask, would you please like, share, and subscribe? Because as you do, you help us reach more people. And I want to see so many lives brought to a real intimacy with Jesus. To know him and be known by him. Something real. So this generation hears the gospel preached in power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Real. Thank you. And would you also consider joining our prayer partnership team? You can go to robertparis.org and go to the partner page. And when you do, you just got to sign up. All we need is your email address. And we're working on some new stuff and I'm going to have more news on it about shortly. But you'll, be, you'll receive our newsletters by email. You'll be invited to our Zoom meetings and ministry time. And you'll soon have access to a dashboard. More's coming. But I ask that as prayer partners, you would pray for us. Because I believe that the impact, one of getting that message in season that's always now comes through prayer. And that word having an impact on life comes through prayer. And I believe that as you make an agreement to pray for us and pray for the partners, you have others praying for you. Just when you need it. And finally, when we stand before the Lord and we receive the reward for all the backsliders, and I'm after backsliders, and we're seeing so many of them. Read the testimonies. Share one if you've got one. I love it. And we stand before the Lord of all those backsliders brought back. And all those backsliders that got a hold of God and the purpose and began to preach this gospel and souls were one for Jesus. You receive a reward for all that. You're sharing it. That's priceless. If you want to be a financial partner, we need those because we're working on a book and working on some other things and they take finances. But to become a prayer partner costs you nothing. And we don't manipulate or ask, try to take money out of you. I want people stirred by the Spirit to give, freely give and be a part of something. Amen. Oh, I want you to know that we're praying for you, we're grateful for you, you're loved. And I desire so much with all my heart, soul, mind, and being that you would experience Him fully in the secret place. And that your life will be so changed starting today. And every day you'll be found in that secret place. Amen. Thank you for watching. Check out more in the series. We're making this whole new series and we're numbering them. There's A, B, C, and D different aspects, and they go a number. More information, just check below. But be blessed, be encouraged, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.